Um, I was just telling Ron, you know, Ron was saying uh, that uh, the false order is a very strong, let's start my time here, it's a very strong title, um, right? And of course, I chose a strong title to fill seats. Uh, so I want to thank you all for being here. Um, but we're just going to basically go through uh, a little bit about Myers-Briggs today and a lot more of the history side of it as opposed to kind of what it currently is today. Um, there's a fantastic book out, and I'll talk about that in a minute. That's where I've gotten some information from. But just a really fun fact to start off. If you want to obtain a hard copy of the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, which is the most popular, by far the most popular personality test in the world, you have to pay $1,700 and take a week-long certification um, run by the Myers-Briggs Foundation. So that's, and I've heard four days, I mean, Ryan, your wife, you said, had done a couple of them, right? Usually four days, sometimes a week. Um, so it's not cheap. Uh, and if you want to be an expert on Myers-Briggs, you need to do this certification. So I'm taking donations. If anybody wants to pay my way to be certified in Myers-Briggs, then I can speak with a little bit more authority. Um, but I did do some research. Uh, again, the, the person I'm pulling a lot of this information from, her name is Merve Erme. Um, she's an author, a writer. Um, she wrote this book, The Personality Brokers. It just came out in August. So if you're actually interested in really the historical side of it and looking at Catherine Briggs and Isabel Myers-Briggs, right, a mother and daughter duo, uh, this is, that's really at the heart of this text. Um, so I have not read this book yet, um, but I read a long article that uh, Mervé wrote based on this book. Um, so, you know, like all Steven Seagal movies, uh, they begin with the credits, which is what I'm gonna do too. Uh, Mervé Erme, she's an associate professor of English at Oxford. She wrote an article for Dig called Uncovering the Secret History of Myers-Briggs. She wrote this book, it's gotten great reviews. Uh, Bradley Bevender, he's an author, writer, he lives in Boston. He wrote an article, The Most Popular Personality Test in the World is a Joke, referring to MBTI, obviously. Uh, Alana E. Strauss, assistant editor at From the Grapevine, her article is for The Atlantic, and that's soul searching through the Myers-Briggs test. That one was probably the most positive of the articles that I read. And again, with all these articles, with all these writings, and even what I want you to leave here today, um, there are some good things about Myers-Briggs test. I don't want you to leave here thinking like, oh, this is the worst thing in the world. Uh, there are certainly some, some interesting parts of it, which I'm excited to talk to you about. Uh, a couple more credits. Uh, my lovely wife, Annie, for uh, dealing with my research and uh, my late hours and my grumpiness. And then, of course, I couldn't be here without the help of the Afternoon Sports Podcast. <laughs> uh, if you're frustrated or angry, angry with me at any point or you just have a question, um, email the Afternoon or Podcast at gmail.com and uh, we will respond to you. So to start off, I want to read a short blurb uh, about this book. Personality Brokers contains a judicious amount of historical context. We learn, for instance, how the Office of Strategic Services, request, which was the CIA, originally the CIA, requested the first set of Isabel's test booklets during the war's final year for use on its covert operatives, and how Truman Capote, who's extroverted and feeling, and the literary critic Kenneth Burke, who's introverted and thinking, became increasingly irritated with each other in front of an amused psychologist. Mm -hmm. But it's Catherine and Isabel who are at the core of this story, and Emre depicts these two women, long dead and largely unknown, with the acuity they deserve. Isabel, in particular, is drawn with precise, confident strokes. There she is in her mid-60s, skipping to the podium in front of an audience of psychologists. There she is again, roaming the hallways of the testing service that employed her. Her breasts sour with the scent of her homemade energy drink, milk, brewer's yeast, and melted Hershey's bars. There she is at home, an elderly lady chafing at the condescension of a 27-year-old statistician with whom she is forced to work compiling a secret file on his various misdeeds with the forthright title, Larry Stricker, Damn Him. <laughs> so much for the sweet magnanimity of each type of its own special advantages, but if there's a theme in the personality brokers woven throughout and never belabored, it's that the self is a little more slippery than we allow. And that's basically what we're gonna be talking about today. So, I encourage you to buy this book, um, but let's talk about what the Myers-Briggs type indicator is. How many of you have taken the MBTI once? How many of you have taken it more than once? Oh, about the same. Okay. Has anybody only taken it once? A couple of people? Okay. Um, were those for, what were some of those things for? Were those for job interviews? Were those for? For four clubs, right? So it's required for four, right? So that's why I'm uh, kind of in the spotlight here because we do this for four. Myers Briggs personality categories. There are some people who haven't taken it. These are the, uh, the four different categories. 
at Myers-Briggs and posit that you can either be introverted or extroverted, or you can lean heavily towards introverted or extroverted. You can be sensing or intuitive. You can be thinking or feeling. You can be judging or perceiving. So an example of a type is ISFP. There are 16 different types. This was officially created in 1942, though depending on the form, it could be a little bit earlier, it could be a little bit later. Um, and these are based off of a famous psychologist, Carl Jung. He had actually six of these types, so introverted, extroverted, sensing, intuitive, thinking, feeling, were straight from Carl Jung. Judging and perceiving was kind of added in by Catherine Briggs and Isabel Myers. So that was a, a category that they sort of decided to, to add into this to better round out uh, our observation of what a person is. But what is MBTI used for? Apparently it's uh, exclusive for core. Um, but businesses, right? Businesses use this for personal management. I think it's 87 of the top 100 Fortune 500 companies use MBTI. I don't know how many of the top 500 use it, but I would assume that number is still very impressive as well. So businesses are using this, um, right? Colleges use this, college counselors use this. This is, this is everywhere. Um, I, I've gone to conferences where this has been uh, either offered or a part of the discussion. Um, so the Myers-Briggs personality, or Myers-Briggs type indicator is a significantly large type indicator. Um, that's not necessarily what we're talking about today, because I think MBTI is a little bit different than even what Catherine wanted, and even what Isabel wanted, and certainly what Carl Jung wanted. I don't think it was ever what he wanted it to be. Um, but we have a picture here to give you guys uh, some input on our famous duo. So on the right, you'll see is uh, Catherine Cook Briggs. It's the mother of Isabel Myers Briggs. And uh, Isabel, ultimately, we're going to get to her, but she's really the brain behind MBTI. That Catherine kind of was the, uh, the Kickstarter. At one point, um, Isabel sort of referred to as Catherine's apostle. Um, so they are a very tight duo. They're very loyal to one another. Well, I think uh, the daughter is loyal to the mother. The mother gets a little bit jealous and bitter at a couple points in their relationship, which is pretty, pretty sad. But a couple years after Isabel was born in 1897, Catherine was on a quest to create civilized adults. Uh, she turned her living room into, this is fantastic, she turned her living room into the cosmic laboratory of baby training. Um, so something you need to understand about Catherine, right? So like, my MBTI starts with Catherine, and it starts in the cosmic laboratory of baby training. Um, she studied agricultural, uh, she got a degree in agricultural from Michigan State, um, so she dabbled in botany, but her true calling was in order, right? So that's the theme of this focus series is order, and Catherine craved it. Uh, she desired it. She was probably obsessive compulsive in a lot of ways. Um, she would conduct behavioral experiments, not only on her daughter Isabel, but on neighborhood children. Um, so like play friends, and again, I don't, you know, we're not going to go into details of necessarily what that looked like, this is behavioral stuff, right? So she's trying to figure out how can I make, um, a lot of times what she's trying to figure out is how can I make a, the best housewife? How can I train my daughter up to be this sort of perfect, per, perfect person? Um, she kept her notes in a notebook called The Diary of an Obedience Curiosity Mother. Uh, that was, those were the two traits she really wanted to instill in her daughter was obedience and curiosity. And for all the faults and shortcomings, Isabel did have both of those traits. She was extremely loyal, but she was also very curious, and this plays out in her life as she goes on to develop the MBTI. Uh, Catherine referred to, so again, a lot of this is coming from Carl Jung, who I'm going to talk about in a moment, but she referred to his writings as uh, basically her Bible. That's in quotes, Bible. Um, Jung wrote a text, uh, Psychological Types, um, and that was what she had written to him about as being her Bible, and she wanted to work with him on the whole idea of type and typology. Um, Jung was not as excited as she was. Uh, so while Catherine kicked this off, she was never really successful. She tried her hand at being a fiction writer. That didn't really take off. I believe that text was called The Guesser, uh, the story of a love affair between two incompatible Jungian types. So you had an introvert and an extrovert, and she's using this novel as a way to, again, push typology. Because from her perspective, she sees this as a way to create order. If she can understand everything about a person, then she can kind of have that order and control that she craves. Um, it was summarily rejected by 10 publishers and two film producers. 
for uh, dwelling a little too much on Young. I think she had a little bit too much of a fascination. Uh, she did find some success. In 1926, she published a personality paint box, which this is the precursor to the MBTI. Uh, this is it in its sort of larval form. Um, and people loved it. Um, it was creating a personality portrait. She claimed even babies, little bundles of psychic energy had types. And the sooner a mother identified her child's type, the better it was for that baby's mental maturity. Um, so there is a, there's kind of running throughout the history of MBTI this theme and this idea of guilt or shaming almost, that if you do this, uh, the people around you are going to be better off. You're going to be better off. Your, your baby is going to be better off. Um, unfortunately, that's not necessarily true. Um, even though she believes that one need not be a psychologist in order to collect and identify types, any more than one needs to be a botanist to collect and identify plants. Um, so again, the big takeaway with Catherine is that she really wants things to be in order. And this is her way of doing it. Carl Jung was sort of this godsend to her to be able to keep her life under control and under control as she kind of saw it. Well, we've talked about Jung a lot, so let's talk in. I, uh, I think that's a very attractive man. My wife referred to him as stern. <laughs> <laughs> like he wears his mustache well, those are perfect glasses. So this is Carl Jung. Um, this is who you should know more about than Catherine or Isabel. And the big reason you probably have heard of Young before, or at least something about him, is because MBTI, when they are bragging about their history, they don't brag about Catherine and Isabel. They brag about Carl Young. Um, so Isabel and Catherine might come up, but they, like, within the MBTI, within uh, the CAPT Foundation, which is the Center for, um, where do I have it here somewhere? Center for Psychological Typing or something like that. That's sort of the foundation that protects MBTI. They always point to Young. They never really point to Catherine and Isabel. They say, oh yeah, Catherine and Isabel started this, but it's really seeped in uh, Jungian types. Um, and uh, Carl would really not be excited about that. So in 2013, he wrote Psychological Types. This is what, uh, or no, sorry. 1923 is when Catherine first encountered Psychological Types. In 27, she wrote to him to express her furish admiration for this. This is when she's connecting with him. They actually wrote back and forth to one another. Um, Carl Jung is doing this because he's trying to figure out, he's trying to reconcile um, Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler. So they kind of had two different varied perspectives of psychology. We're not going to get into the details of that. But they were at odds with each other. And Jung's trying to figure out why are they at odds with each other. Like These two sort of giants of psychology, I respect them. Why are they, why don't they see eye to eye? Why are their theories different? So he kind of invents typology to explain this because he sees Freud and Jung, or he sees Freud and Albert as two different people or two different types. Um, and this is very much from a theoretical perspective. This is him working things out in his head. This is him figuring out how can I work with someone one on one in the context of their life. Um, and that's not really how Catherine and Isabel take his work. They take it, how can I spread this to the most people, the fastest, in a very standardized, cut and dry way? Um, so they were kind of at odds. Um, Catherine wrote to him for advice about a neighborhood child. So again, this is her cosmic laboratory. She's having problems with this child. Uh, Young actually rebukes her for overstepping her bounds. Mm -hmm. um, his perspective is, in this instance, you should be an observer. But Catherine's attitude is, no, I need to get in there, and I need to fix people. Uh, he says, you overdid it. You wanted to help, which is an encroachment upon the will of others. Your attitude ought to be that of one who offers an opportunity that can be taken or rejected. Otherwise, you are most likely to get in trouble. It is so because man is not fundamentally good. Almost half of him is a devil. This is a great quote. Mm -hmm. uh, but the big takeaway there is that uh, they're coming from very different perspectives. But ultimately, uh, the Myers-Briggs Foundation wins out. And Young is kind of carried along on this wave that he wasn't really trying to create in the first place. Um, but that's the, they are important, but they're not the stars of our story. The stars of our story is Isabel Myers-Briggs. Um, this is Isabel when she's a little bit younger. This is Isabel when she's a little bit older. Again, she's the daughter of Catherine. She is an apostle of Catherine. She loves her mother. She, her mother is very dear to her. Uh, Catherine, unfortunately, like I said, is a little bit bitter uh, that Isabel ends up reaping a lot more success than her. And the big place that Isabel really hits it off 
is when she decides to write fiction. Um, and we are quickly coming up to the part that I'm most excited to discuss. <laughs> Catherine writes fiction. She writes a novel, um, Murder Yet to Come. She submits that to New McClure's magazine. She ends up winning this mystery novel, even though her mother said that it was um, an interesting read, I think is what she said. She sort of slammed the style a little bit. Um, but this is Catherine's bitterness or jealousy kind of coming out. Isabel wins $7,500, which um, is over $100,000 today, to give you some context. And she gets a book contract with a pop prominent New York publisher. This book was reprinted by CAT, which again is this sort of Myers-Briggs Protector Foundation. CAT republishes it in 1995. To give you an idea of what Murray Yet to Come is, uh, there are three detectives. One's a military man, another's a female playwright. I forget who the third one is. But they all sort of fit into this different type of person. Uh, because, again, this is just sort of a way for her to push what her mother started, which was typology. Get it out to the most people, we can create the most order, um, and everything's going to be great. So Cap reprints this. Uh, they say it's beautifully consistent with type portraits. Those readers who know type will enjoy typing the characters as the mystery progresses. So this novel is, you know, from what I've read from more objective sources, it's fine. It's a fine mystery novel. It's not great. It doesn't knock your socks off. But it's not her most interesting work. Um, Cap's website claims that the novel was Isabel's only sojourn into fiction. This is not true. This is pleasantly not true. Uh, in 1934, Isabel wrote, wrote her second novel, Give Me Death. This revisits our same trio of detectives five years down the road. So these three, you know, they're solving crimes. They work together like cogs in a machine. They get along really well, even though they're all so different. Uh, they go on to solve more members. And I'm just going to read this word for word here uh, to give you a little idea of what the plot of this story is. One by one, members of, the land, of a land-owning Southern family begin committing suicide when they are led to believe that there is, quote, in our veins, a strain of Negro blood. Despite their differences, the detectives agree that it is, quote, better for the family to be dead than for them to be alive, heedlessly reproducing with white people. Um, you might be able to understand why Capt doesn't want to reprint this text of Isabel's. Um, right? That's uh, not only just grossly uh, filled with racism, but also there's eugenics in there as well, right? They'd be better off, better off for the family to be dead for them to be alive. So obviously Kapp is going to republish one book, say it's her only work in the fiction, uh, and kind of ignore this other book. But unfortunately that's not the only place where uh, racism or, or racial issues pop up in Catherine, or in Isabel's writing. Um, yeah, so, uh, Unfortunately, that's, uh, that's part of the reality of the history of the MBTI. Um, and there are other issues there. I'm going to talk a little bit more about race in a little bit here. But I want to go a little bit more through the chronology. But before I talk about some of the issues, that's sort of going to be at the end of this talk. Um, so we're still sort of in the chronology of it. Um, the next person in our story here, before we come back to Isabel, is uh, Edward N. Hay. I wasn't sure which one of these gentlemen was Edward N. Hay. He wasn't super famous, so <laughs> you can pick whoever you want with your picture holder <laughs> as I talk about him. He's, he's probably one of these three. Um, <laughs> whichever one you want is who it can be. <laughs> right, so Isabel sort of carries the torch of her mother's typology. And again, Isabel is a big favor, or a big fan of, um, of order as well. So how does she do this? How does she go from a fiction writer with you know, a successful first book and a, a another book. Um, how does she go from right square, whatever that is, to MBTI being everywhere, right? It's literally everywhere now. Enter Edward N. Hay, a family friend of Isabel's and one of the first management consultants, right? This is in the, uh, this is in the 40s, right? So this is World War II. This is when management consultation kind of comes into the picture. Um, he sets up shop in the U.S. Um, and Isabel approaches him in 1942 with her first copy of the MBTI, right? So this is her mother Catherine's, you know, paint-by-numbers personality box thing. 
uh, redesigned to be a little bit more practical, a little bit more accessible, a little more intense, a little bit more like what we see today. Um, Hayes got all these connections, right? He's this big wig. He works with all of these huge companies. General Electric uh, is one of them, as well as tons of oil companies. And all of these companies are trying to figure out the same thing, right? We're in the 40s, we're trying to figure out productivity, we're trying to figure out how can we make people work better, faster, harder, for cheaper, right? So, hey, gets this, uh, gets this MBTI test from Isabel, but it's not until about 1947 that uh, that it really gets kicking into gear. So with the rise of labor force during and after World War II, um, right, you have women entering the workforce like you've never had them entering before. You also have, after World War II, this huge influx of GIs, and you have these federal laws that are trying to get jobs for all of these veterans. And that's where personality tests really kind of explode. So MBTI wasn't the first or the only one in this era, it's just the one that's kind of come out on top. Um, Right, so other examples, you have the Thurston Temperament Schedule, the Personality Inventory, the Personal Audit, How to Supervise. All of these kind of had the same promise of how to manage this, this giant pool of millions of workers that like weren't here before. Um, again, most of them were women, most of them were veterans. Uh, yeah, let me see where I'm going here. So again, the promise was the reason the reason Isabel and these companies and these corporations saw eye to eye is because they both wanted the same thing. They both wanted order. They both wanted organization in the time that was very chaotic. So Isabel sees big companies, big corporations as a way I can get this out to more people. Corporations see this as a way like, oh, we can use this to weed out the workers we don't want or put people in jobs that are going to suit them. And that was the promise Isabel gave was that tight would equal productivity, that type would fit you into a job, so you would take this test, and if you're extroverted, you're going to be going over to sales. If you're introverted, you're going to be mopping the floors. Um, like, it is, it is actually what is going on. Um, perhaps the most, uh, what I found to be one, one of the more horrifying examples of how this was used, um, Isabel actually sold this test to an insurance company twice. The first time they bought it was so that they could distribute it to their employees, right? They're like, oh, who do we want selling insurance? We want the extroverts. Um, who do we want behind the scenes doing the data? Oh, we want the figures. We don't want the feelers doing that. But the second time they bought it, it was to distribute to people who actually wanted to buy health insurance. And it's because Isabel wrote very confidently that extroverts are more likely to have risk-embracing behavior, which means that they're more likely to die. So if you were an extrovert in this time period, <laughs> you're going to be paying a higher premium than an introvert because the MBTI, can you? You're an extrovert, you're paying a much higher premium. Much higher, especially with the baseball jersey, or basketball jersey. So part of the problem is that this is, this is a pseudoscience, right? Like this is not a hard science. You can't go to uh, your doctor's office, get a blood test, and he can say like, oh yeah, according to your blood, you know, you're an INFP. Like no, this is a test that's been cookie cutted out for you to step into um, and they will tell you, oh, this is what you are based on your answers, you know, on a Thursday afternoon after, you know, a stressful day of work. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into those details because there are some arguments against what I just said. But, right, life insurance. If somebody depends on you financially, then you need it. And that's true. Listen, look at me, everybody. That's true. If somebody depends on you, you need to get life insurance. When you get married, get life insurance. When you have a baby, get life insurance. Just don't do one that uh, uses the MBTI. <laughs> so by the mid-1950s, she's working with all these companies, right? So 47 is when her sort of final format goes out. Edward Hay goes on a rampage selling this to everybody. And by the 50s, everybody is using it. But if you're not using it, you're on the outskirts. And all these other personality tests kind of fall by the wayside or are being used by smaller companies. But all the brightest and the biggest and the best are using MBTI to create this, what the Briggs really saw as this like perfect workforce. Um, Isabel has this fantastic quote. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, that's about the, the premiums. She has this fantastic quote talking or saying that workers will never be dissatisfied uh, if they're placed in a job that matches their type. Um, they, will, they will have no dissatisfaction within their work ever if they're placed in the perfect 
uh, in the perfect position. And this idea, too, comes back later in the current MBTI that if you are placed in a job where your type matches this job's type, then we've told, like, we've set it up so everything's going to be perfect. If it's not, then something's wrong with you. The problem lies with you. The problem doesn't lie with MBTI. The problem lies with the person taking it. Um, that problem comes up a lot. Um, but so what, right? So that's kind of the history. So and, and from there, it's just an unstoppable force. At the end of Isabel's life, I think in the 70s, is when CAPT is uh, founded. And the whole purpose of CAPT as a nonprofit is to protect MBTI. And protect that in a lot of ways, right? So there's sort of this like weird kind of secretive side of like, we're not talking about everything that Isabel wrote. There's this almost cultish secrecy around the history of Catherine and Isabel. And that's why Carl Jung is sort of the poster boy for the MBTI. So that's what they're protecting. But they're also protecting in a more practical way of like, oh, we want to sell as much of this as we can. We want to keep MBTI going. It needs to stay relevant. Um, so I don't mean to say protect in that it's just cultish. It is cultish, but it's also a more practical thing. But so what, right? Why do people take the MBTI? And what are the problems with it? Um, right, people take it at least partially, maybe because you have to. Maybe a job interview or an employer that you're newly working for says, hey, everybody that works here takes uh, this uh, personality type indicator, and it's going to tell you a little bit about yourself. Maybe you're entering core at a small liberal arts school in mid-Michigan, and they say, hey, let's take the MBTI so we can figure out more about each other. And there are things that are fine with that, right? There's self-discovery that takes place. Um, even if you're a skeptical cynic like me, I think there are some things you can pull out. One of the um, Mervay Ermang, and the author where I'm pulling a lot of this information from, uh, she went to that uh, certification. She did a full certification as she's doing research for her book. And though she is skeptical and cynical, there are times where she's like, oh, actually, I you know, became close with a couple people there, and one girl really was able to process like why she always butts head with her mom. I was like, ah, that's super helpful. Like, this can give you some insight maybe into your more personal relationship with friends and family. You want to know about others. You want to know about everything. Um, should it be used for jobs? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I get a little skeptical of that. I think primarily because it, it is unable to tell you how effective a person will be at that job. Right? Like you can have an introvert who is good at the same job that an extrovert's good at. And certainly different, type, different types of people and different personalities are good at different things. But just because you take a test and it tells you you have a certain type, doesn't mean that you are less likely to succeed at a specific job. I think that's a little bit narrow-minded. Um, should it be used for health insurance? Certainly not. But it has been. Um, and this kind of leads to another problem of type shaming. It's a common complaint. Um, one woman that, again, Mervay Hermay talked to said, learning my type was mortifying, mostly because my boss outed me as an introvert and a feeler on a team of extrovert and thinkers. Um, right. This is this is a this isn't just a problem with typology. This is a problem with everything. Um, if you are the odd person out on a team, there is um, loneliness there. Right. There's challenges there that don't necessarily need to be there. So really, this can be used as another way to isolate people um, when it when it certainly doesn't need to be. Um, I found a couple of uh, helpful quizzes. So this is Star Wars and Harry Potter. Uh, who's your character? Who's your personality chart? I think I'm uh, Snape on Harry Potter, but then I'm probably more of an R2-D2 over here. Um, and then our own resident, uh, Brent Klein, I believe is ESFJ, which is Jar Jar Binks. Right? So, uh, is that what you were last time you took it? Um, I show this image to, like, to really hammer home the point that MBTI's origins, like where MBTI comes from, is the hobby of two women who are untrained in psychology. A failed author, and then a mildly successful, potentially racist author. author. Um, right, a, a botanist, a woman, uh, pro-eugenics, uh, they don't have any psychology training. Um, Catherine sure was writing Carl Jung, was seeped in all of his work, but again, misinterpreted parts of it. Uh, took a uh, closed approach as opposed to Carl Jung's projective approach, right? Carl Jung wanted this to be a one-on-one -on -one thing. He wanted you to have context with the person that you're instituting this typology with. Catherine wanted everybody to be able to take it for it to be simple and straightforward. 
Um, so again, MBTI, two untrained women uh, who were doing this almost as a habit. Um, oh yeah, I found some more. Uh, so we have The Office and uh, Lord of the Rings, which is just fantastic. Um, but part of the chaos here, which is, again, these, these serve a multiple, multiple purposes. Because part of the chaos with the MBTI is that you are more in control than you think. Um, a great example of this, and I don't have it up here, uh, but I took a, you know those uh, like BuzzFeed quizzes of like, oh, which Stranger Things character are you? <laughs> One of the questions was, what would you fight, who, how many Stranger Things fans are here? Oh, wow, guys, you need to watch Stranger Things on Netflix, it's fantastic. Um, so this is for the Stranger Things fan. It asked, uh, what do you fight a Demogorgon with? And uh, one of the answers was my trusty baseball bat. <laughs> for those of you that are Stranger Things fan, you know exactly what character that's talking about. Um, the same kind of questions pop up on MBTI where you know the answer. Would you rather stay in on a Friday night or go out with friends? Wow. What does that point to? That points to introversion and extroversion, right? You guys, when you're taking these tests, you can kind of see where the outcome's going. Um, not to mention, depending on uh, what mood you're in or what day of the week it is. Part of the problem with this test is that you're more in control um, and it's just not, it's not reliable. Uh, you can take the test. So those of you who have taken the test, you can take the test again five weeks later and there's a greater than 50% chance that you will receive a different type. Um, if you take the test like more than five weeks apart, that jumps to like 75% or something like that. And one of the most important things within any field, especially in the, in the field of science, is reliability and consistency, that you're getting the same results when you do a test over and over again. Like, oh, if I drop a ball, it falls. That, that's a test of gravity. Uh, the MBTI kind of has gravity going all over the place. Um, so Bert Hermes says this beautifully, behind all the pseudoscientific talk of instruments and indicators is a simple but subtle truth. The test reflects whatever version of yourself you want it to reflect. If what you want to see is yourself as odd, or original, or factual, or direct, it only requires a little bit of imagination to nudge the test in the right direction. To rig the outcome ahead of time, I do not mean this in an overtly manipulative sense. Most people do not lie outright, for to do so would be to shatter the illusion of self-discovery that the test projects. I mean quite simply that to succeed, a personality test must introduce the test taker to the preferred version of oneself. A far cry in many cases from what Catherine and Isabel referred to as uh, the authentic shoes off self. That was the state you needed to be in when you took the test. So again, reliability matters, uh, stranger, or strange be fantastic beasts in order to find them, Harry Potter, right? You guys have seen this. Have you taken the Pottermore uh, quiz to find out what your uh, your um, Patronus is? Mine is an Akami, which is this fantastic bird. And my wife is very jealous because hers was a little yippee dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, a test is reliable if it produces the same results from different sources. You know another example of that? If you think your leg is broken, you can be more confident when two different radiologists diagnose a fracture. In personality testing, reliability means con getting consistent results, and you just don't get those with the Myers-Briggs test. Um, Myers-Briggs would say that that, again, this is almost this like bulletproof logic from MBTI, that if you say, like, well, I took the test a couple times and I keep getting a different result, Myers-Briggs puts that blame not on the test, but on you. Uh, it's, it's this bulletproof uh, logic, the circular logic that says, the problem isn't with our test. Our test is, is really spot on. Uh, they would say the problem is with you. You weren't your shoes off self. Maybe you were thinking about work, or maybe you were stressed. And I would argue that, like, man, personality changes. Uh, but Myers-Briggs says, no, personality never changes. Going back to the whole idea of a baby. Uh, MBTI still holds true today that the, the personality you are born with is the personality you will die with. But the type you are born with is the type you will take to your grave. And that's pretty ridiculous. I mean, when you think about all the different ways that your personality can and does change, um, it's, it's just kind of, it, that's the boldest claim, I feel like, from MBTI. So mirror, mirror, um, Oh, there's a great, uh, ah, there's a video, but we don't have time for it. There's a great, uh, Jerry, I, you guys probably don't know Seinfeld anyway. Um, but Jerry Seinfeld, there's a quote where he uh, realizes he's fallen in love with this woman. 
But as he's talking to his best, one of his best friends, Kramer, about it, he says, now I know what I've been looking for for all these years. Myself. I've been waiting for me to come along, and now I've swept myself off my feet. Um, another issue that goes on with MBTI, so there's a great uh, section in this article by Merve Erme, uh, where people are getting together via meetup.com to meet with other like types. And there's this great moment where, uh, in this introverted group, one of the members says, actually, I, I really enjoy going clubbing. Uh, and they throw, immediately throw him out of the group. Because he doesn't fit, right? He doesn't belong. He's an outsider. He doesn't fit in their understanding of order. He's a, a little speck of chaos within this uh, MBTI. And I don't know the I don't know if he took it and it told him he was an introvert, um, but he's still loved clubbing. Um, I think I'm an introvert, and, and I really like clubbing. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we're drawn to people like ourselves, right? I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, right? It, it's, it's fine to be drawn to people with similar interests or similar personalities, but I think it's irresponsible, especially from a Christian perspective, to ignore people that are unlike you, um, that we should be seeking out people that are different than us. Um, and again, I think from the whole idea of the sort of like racial undertones of the, the foundation of the MBTI, there's certainly some underlying problems there where it's all about finding the like person or like people working together and getting along and different types being at odds with one another. And that, that just seems kind of wildly irresponsible to me. Um, another idea, you know, another problem that it boils people down, it sort of flattens them. Um, here's a short list of things that define our humanity, that make us diverse from one another, that aren't really taken into account unless it's in a dehumanizing way. Uh, race. Gender, hobbies, class, language, country of origin, etc. None of these really come into play, uh, even though the MBTI sees itself as all encompassing. Um, and, and part of that too is that, you know, for example, thinking and feeling are seen as polar opposites. Um, but that isn't necessarily true. If you are able to think, you are able to have feelings as well, right? The better you can logically think, the better you can kind of manage your feelings. Um, so to put them as polar opposites, I think, is, is also a little irresponsible and just inc incorrect. Um, how many of you have seen this picture before? Uh, this is not a racist photo. This is my little pulpit right now. Charles Schultz was actually pretty progressive at the time. If you guys want to read a whole article on it, you can go to Snopes.com, which usually is great. a great website for debunking sort of internet myths and things like this. Um, but Charles Schultz actually, against the wishes of his editors, made Franklin uh, a character on, uh, on Peanuts. So this is something that's sort of been taken out of context and is now used as this sort of like racism sometimes itself. Um, but if, you know, if you have a problem with subtle racism, you should have a problem with, with Isabel Briggs too. Um, you can't avoid her perspective. Um, when she talks about typology, she has another quote uh, talking about race and uh, within the context of typing. The very warm evidence on the colored woman to whom one could talk exactly as to equals is another case in point. Members of a dark and supposedly <coughs> inferior race are standard symbol for the suppressed and considered inferior part of one's own psyche. So even within the MBTI, even though it's got this sort of banner of uh, all types are equal, there's still inequality sort of seeped within Isabel's creation of MBTI. So, big question, why is it still here? Why is it still so popular? Because it promises things, right? It promises self-awareness. It allows you to justify shortcomings. I'm an N, so I can't see the details. You know, I need, I need someone who's not an N to help me with the details. Uh, I'm a J, so I'm really impatient, right? I don't need to work on my impatience. It's just who I am. Of course I punch that guy in the face. I'm an F and he's a T, right? Like, this is just a way to sort of justify our shortcomings and not have to work on them. Um, and, and that's a cynical perspective, right? You could also say like, well, this makes you aware of your shortcomings so that you can work on them. But if you're taking a hard MBTI line, you would say, well, you can't work on them because your type never changes. Um, so that's just fantastic. Uh, the reinforcement to make decisions we're scared to make, right? Quitting a job, like, oh, I don't know what to do about this relationship. Like, I've been dating this person. Well, I'll take the MBTI. Oh, now I understand that we're just incompatible and I'm going to walk away from this. That's such an easy 
like, thank you so much, Isabel, for the excuse to get out of this relationship rather than working at it. Um, but it promises order in a messy world. And I think the reality is, is that people are just messy and we're in a messy world. And the MBTI and other personality tests, right, I know, Ron, we were talking about the Enneagram, that one's really taking off. Um, there are a lot of these tests that are still popular and still being used, but you know, I just wanted to kind of challenge the perspective that these are going to help solve your problems. Uh, they might give you a little bit of insight. They might give you a direction to go. Maybe they'll help you figure out why you argue with your mother while you're baking. Um, but these aren't uh, the end all be all. Um, and I don't, again, I don't mean to completely discredit it, I just mean to partially discredit it. Um, so what happened with Mervé Hervé? Uh, part of her research was she wanted to go to the University of uh, Florida's library where Isabel Briggs, all of her writings, right, her journals, um, her notes, her anything she's ever written, University of Florida has it in this sort of uh, special collections division, right, which sounds like it's out of Stranger Things. Um, <laughs> So they said, like, oh, what's your research? Why are you doing this? She's like, well, I'm writing this book. I want to know more about the history of Catherine and Isabel. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we want you to become certified first. Take the certification program, and we'll set a bunch of stuff aside for you, and we're excited for you to come. So she went through the certification. She reconnected with them, said, hey, I went through the certification. I'd love to schedule a time to come down to the University of uh, Florida's library. And they said, no, we are blocking that all off from researchers at this time. Uh, so she is kind of aware that they were probably aware of what her goal and her mission was, and they blocked that off from her. And if that's not a warning bell, I don't know what is. Uh, that you have all of these documents in this public library, but you're able to say like, no, sorry, you can't read them. Um, you, you're, you're just digging a little bit too deep. Um, so right, I've shared with you guys about um, right, this, this book that Capt didn't reprint, um, but that's public knowledge. Like, Right, it just makes me wonder, like, what's, what's private? What's in there? What are, they, what, are they really, uh, what are they really hiding? So some other fun facts. Um, I've covered a couple of these. Actually, I think I've covered all of them. Oh, no, there's one more fun fact. The Barnum effect. Have any of you heard of the Barnum effect before? Uh, or the Forer effect. It's a common psychological phenomenon whereby individuals give high accuracy ratings to descriptions of their personality that supposedly are tailored specifically to them. So if you want the Barnum effect in full, just go to the, um, what's it in the newspaper? The uh, horoscopes. horoscopes. Yes, right? Go to the horoscopes. Because those are vague enough that they can fit to anyone. Um, but that's what's potentially, to some extent, happening in these personality tests. Um, there is, uh, yeah. Some uh, phrases you might find in the Barnum effect. You have a great need for other people to like and admire you. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a great deal of unused capacity which you have not turned to your advantage. While you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them, right? Like we can all identify with these to some extent or another. Um, and I'm not saying the MBTI is this 100% Barnum effect thing, but I know I've certainly gone through some personality tests where it's just like, ah, you could, this, this is just a sort of cookie cutter phrase that could really fit to anybody in the room. Um, and a lot of that research showed that, you know, when people are given these results, they just say like, oh yeah, it's actually very accurate. Um, so I wanted to challenge you all to be a little bit more skeptical, to be a little bit more critical when you're thinking like, oh, I'm taking these tests. Does this really apply to me? Or is, could this just apply to anybody? Could it apply to both people sitting next to me? Could I go to somebody who's supposedly a completely different type and it would apply to them in some way or another? Um, yeah. So, that's kind of the end of my research. I know I rambled and, and wandered all over the place. It was a little bit chaotic, if you would say. Uh, but I know we have some time for questions. Um, you know, I've got references up here, so if you want to read the articles I read, that's what I was reading. Um, but again, that book would solve a lot of your questions, I'm sure. But if anybody has questions on MBTI, uh, I guess I'm the expert in the room. <laughs> As uh, a lovely lady in the back. <laughs> so, I've heard you talk about this at home, obviously, a lot. But I think one thing that came to my mind yeah. as you were talking now is 
Isabel and Catherine as women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a in a world, especially in their time when there were probably not a lot of women in science. Mm -hmm. So has there been anything that you found on that when you're reading about this stuff that touches on that a little bit more of like them not being taken seriously because they were women in that time or I don't know. It's just yeah. a thought I have. No, that's a great point. And I think, um, right, I know Catherine got a, her degree was in agriculture from Michigan State, which at that time was like a school of agriculture. Right. Um, so though this was their interest in their hobby, maybe they didn't have the space to study what they really wanted to study. And both Catherine and Isabel kind of have this similar life of getting married, of having kids, and being dissatisfied with that. So uh, Catherine, the mother, kind of acts out with her cosmic baby laboratory. And that's her way of like working out this interest of hers. Isabel um, is really dissatisfied for a while and doesn't know what to do. She's, a, you know, from her mother's perspective, She's a good, Isabel is a good mother to her children. Um, her husband, I think, is a little bit dissatisfied with her as like a homemaker, um, but that really wasn't what she wanted to do. In terms of, you know, the approach of them wanting to pursue a more official psychological, you know, like psychology profession, I haven't read anything specifically on that. Um, yeah. So sorry, I don't know. Just something I thought. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Have I convinced anybody? Were there any like diehard at ETI? No. But no. Yeah. I, I've done um, more than just MBTI. Yeah. Strengths Quest. Yes. Um, there's a um, the uh, animal. Yeah, the lion and the otter, right? Mm -hmm. Labrador, I think, is one. Labrador. Mm -hmm. A beaver. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. All of those instruments. Mm -hmm. Talk about preference. Yeah. So it's, it is, in essence, self created. Mm -hmm. Chaos comes into our lives by those factors mm -hmm. that we do not and cannot control. Mm -hmm. And you put this in it race, gender, all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. And it plays havoc with our sense of order. If God has created the universe mm -hmm. with order, how do we then develop an understanding of that order, that need, that overwhelming need to fit into order, yeah. rather than the order to be imposed? Sure. Well, you can pay $50 and take the MBTI. Yes. <laughs> no, and again, I don't mean to discredit it entirely and say that this is worthless, um, but I think there are questions to be asked. And I think, you know, part of these things that are, are out of control, um, you know, part of the issue there is that they still play, play into our identity and who we are. Um, so though we can't control them, we can control um, you know, what they mean to us or how they matter yeah. to us. How we interact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brett Klein. <laughs> so, um, there's a lot of similarities with this history and the history of the IQ test. Like the guy, Albert Binet mm -hmm. is the guy who invents the IQ test and he actually intends that test to be taken it's adapted, it only can be given within an individual contact between a teacher and a student. It's meant to individualize education. It comes across the what country, is he? Is he he's from France. Okay. Uh, yeah. It comes to the United States and that test becomes the Stanford Binet test. It's then used on military uh, people in World War I. Yeah. We get eugenics and this is what the IQ test becomes. Yeah. Um, and now, maybe in 2018, we think of IQ and we sort of like laugh at it and be like, oh, that's unfair and stuff like that. Sure. But there's a really, similar history of people maybe 40 years ago saying like, what's your IQ? And yeah. now we understand, well, that has really harmful effects about how we understand the mind. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about what you think this would have on effects of the self. Like how does, if, if having a misunderstanding of what an IQ test is and an unfair test messes up how we understand the mind, how does an unfair test mess up how we understand the self. So like what misunderstandings of self are happening when people are cultish? Sure. Because if someone is upset about this, it is cultish behavior. Because <laughs> you're upset about it. So 
So I'm curious about like what does that mean about understandings of the self itself? And you can answer that theologically, we can answer it psychologically or culturally, however however you want. Sure. Um, yeah, and actually read about the IQ test. I think I like, you know, went down a rabbit trail and read about that. Because the whole goal of the IQ test was to improve education in France, right? That like the creator of that believed IQ was flexible, was malleable, and then it kind of became this beast out of his control um, that was used as this thing of like, no, it's not flexible, like your IQ is your IQ, and, and um, so you're right, that's a, that's a great parallel. Um, how does this affect yourself, right? I was told by uh, some good friends that I'm a seven on the Enneagram, and part of that is because I am very skeptical of the Enneagram, and I told them something like, oh, you're kind of acting like a seven right now. Uh, to which I had some very choice words in response for that. But I think part of the, the idea, right, is that this does limit what we believe, like, ourselves, ourselves are, like, what the self is. This does boil it down, this does simplify it, right? So if you say, like, oh, I'm an INFP, immediately I make, you're making assumptions about me. If you tell me you are this specific type, you're immediately jumping and making assumptions about me. Um, so I think the whole idea there, in terms of what this can do to itself, I think it can be damaging, especially, man, if, if you're doing this with kids, um, how limiting, right? And this fits into this whole idea from Isabel and Catherine of like having order, but order really being about control. Um, really being able to implement control over children. That was what Catherine wanted to do with Isabel. That's what Isabel wanted to do with everybody. Um, and that's why businesses kind of bought into this and still buy into this because if we can control our employees, if we can control um, you know, X, Y, and Z, then we can control our profits. But I think when that comes down to that individual level, you start looking at, um, that, that's where the, the problems probably most start to arise uh, because all of a sudden you aren't uh, you know, you aren't all these things that make up a human being, you're just an INFP. And I don't know why I keep saying INFP, but that's the one, maybe, uh, maybe there's something, maybe I'm an INFP, and that's a little Freudian slip. So I think that's where the problem really arises, is that it's limiting. It's sort of minimalistic instead of being maximalistic. It's, oh, now that I know my type, and now that I know your type, our relationship is pretty much figured out. Like we can solve every problem from this point forward using typology, uh, as opposed to this maximalist perspective, where it's like, oh, maybe typing helps, you know, helps understand why we struggle in this one scenario, but that shouldn't be applied to every situation, um, right? Because sometimes I like going out on the town with friends, and sometimes I like staying home to read a book. Um, so to be labeled as an extrovert or an introvert. Not only is that limiting, but maybe you start living into that type as well, and you're just sort of feeding into this illusion, this uh, this like non-existent person that MBTI has told you you are, uh, which just sounds kind of nuts, uh, right? Like you're right, that that doesn't sound cultish. I don't know what does. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Any student questions <laughs> or comments? I'm at a serious, but I have a yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so where do we go from here, Billy? Like, any freshmen in the room? You guys talked about your my plan yet? You yeah. have. So in the future, they will. You all will probably engage this. So how would you encourage them to engage it next time? You know, as they are requested by their employer, take it before their interview. You know. So what kind of Encouragement do you have? Yeah, that's that's tough because you may just be applying for jobs where every job's like, hey, we want you to take the MBTI, and you need a job, right? Like, I get that. Um, so it's kind of this problem of being in a system where it's asking for it, right? I'm not telling you to go to your uh, the next, you know, your next core class where you're taking another strengths quest thing and say like, no, I'm not taking this. It'd be fantastic if you did that. Um, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not telling you to do that. Re don't do that, okay? Um, so that's challenging, maybe that's the million dollar question. I do think having conversations like really pushing, uh, you know, when you guys are having those debrief sessions, don't just check out. If you think it's incorrect or inaccurate, or you want to push it or challenge it, or say like, hey, Billy said this is a hoax, this is what, this is what he thinks, uh, by all means do that, because things aren't going to change unless uh, people push for that change. Um, so maybe in you know 
20, 30 years when you guys are on top, uh, owning all the top, you know, 100, 500 fortune companies, whatever they are, uh, you guys can say, we're not doing this anymore. Um, so either engage it as well as you can, or don't engage it, right? Like, I would, I would really say don't pay 50 bucks to take this test. Um, spend that on uh, a nice dinner out with your friends. Like, do something a little bit more fun that maybe is going to be a little bit more organic. It's a great question. I don't have an answer for it. Yeah. So let's say you go into a job interview someday, yeah. and they want you to take this test. Yeah. Do you think it would be wrong to skew the results of the test purposefully, just because you know what they want you to be? I mean, kind of asking, like, do you I steal mean, a bread and loaf to feed your family? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you need a job, get a job. I mean, if, you're, if you're just like, oh, I'm taking this test, uh, I know they're looking for an extrovert, right? right? If anything, I've given you the knowledge you need to get the results that are going to get you the job you want. Um, so yeah, I don't know, like... Uh, get the job and do whatever you want to do. Yeah, and too, with like a lot of these, uh, with these tests, right? You're like taking it once, you're doing one summary debrief session, and then that's not really coming back again. Um, so I mean, if it's a necessary evil, that sounds kind of defeatist, but uh, yeah, it's necessary. there are a lot of necessary things. It's a great question. Let me know how your next test goes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Or yeah. Um, well, I guess, okay, so I, I focus on, like, I'm not as big on this one, but I yeah. do like the Enneagram, mm -hmm. and I've, like, talked about that, and I think, like, the biggest thing for me in terms of personality tests is, like, not doing that as, like, the know-all be-all, because a lot of times when people are like, okay, so if I'm a two on the Enneagram, that doesn't mean that I'm every single thing, but the biggest thing that we've talked about is, like, okay, the unhealthy side versus the healthy side of, sure. like, a personality, mm -hmm. and it's, like, for me, I've used them as men, like, okay, these are tendencies I may have, but that doesn't mean I'm automatically, like, 100% all these tendencies, yeah. and so that was, like, even with this one, too, is, like, a lot of times it's, like, so I technically am an introvert, but, mm -hmm. like, I have, still have extroverted tendencies, so it's, like, but it's really interesting to be like people who don't know psychology at all just decided to make a test. Yeah, right. That's fascinating. And, but, and again, like reliability comes back into it. Your experience is kind of speaking about it. Like, oh, I tested as an introvert, but sometimes I'm an extrovert. Mm -hmm. um, right? Like, if you take this once, like even a year later, you take it again, there's 75% chance you're going to have a different score. Mm -hmm. And I think that just points to the diversity of each of us, right? Like how complicated people are. Um, and that's a problem of these things is that inherently their goal is to categorize people. And that's just more challenging to do than I think these tests make it sound like. Um, and again, you're right. I think you're coming at it from a much healthier perspective of like, oh, this is something that informs me a little bit about myself, but it's not this end all be all. It's not this label or this box or this like form that I fit. Um, definitely skew more to that side than to the side of like, oh, you know, when I go to a mixer for work, I write my name and my type on my name type. Right? Like that happens. Like that's these things happen where people are like, "Hey, this is my name. This is also a personality type I have." It's like, "Oh man!" Like, no, you're you're putting your this this MBTI uh, test on the same level as your name. Um, that's weird. Uh, MBTI uh, will also uh, absolutely disagree with you if you call it a personality test. It is not a personality test. It is a type indicator. Um, so there's some fun lingo for you. Don't refer to it as a test, or you'll be chastised. So. Last question. One more or none? All right. Thank you so much for coming.